Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We're so thankful that you can be here tonight as part of our New Hampshire votes, making your vote count in 2020. This is part of our larger She Votes series, which I'll be telling you more about later this evening. But in the meantime, if you want to go to nhwomensfoundation.org 19th, you can learn more about it. I'm particularly thankful to have wonderful friends serving as panelists and moderator. Special, special thanks tonight to Senator Melanie Levake, Representative Margie Smith, Palana Belkin, trans justice organizer at the ACLU of New Hampshire, and our dear friend, Maggie Goodlander. As you know, on August 18, 1920, the 19th Amendment of the US Constitution made voting a right regardless of gender. But millions of women, including women of color, were still excluded from the ballot box for generations. As we celebrate and honor the centennial, we must commit to fulfilling the promise of the 19th Amendment by ensuring that all people can vote. And here in New Hampshire, we're seeing all sorts of difficulties with people being able to vote. And the Women's Foundation is committed to ensuring that you have the knowledge and information you need to be able to vote. So as we go into the next 100 years, we can be sure that every woman has the right to vote and her vote is counted. Tonight, Maggie Goodlander will be facilitating the conversation. If you're not familiar with Maggie, let me tell you a very little bit about her. She's a lawyer who lives here in Portsmouth and teaches constitutional law and administrative law at UNH School of Law. She spent much of the past decade working in legal and policy positions in each branch of the United States government and in both houses of Congress. Maggie served as a law clerk to U.S. Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer and Judge Merrick Garland of the U.S. Court of Appeals. More recently, Maggie was called down to D.C. to work on the articles of impeachment against President Donald Trump. She was born and raised in Nashua. She's a new lieutenant in the U.S. Navy Reserve and serves on the board of directors of New Hampshire Legal Assistance and the World Affairs, World Affairs Council of New Hampshire. Maggie, thank you so much for facilitating this conversation, and I'd be pleased if you'd get started. Well, thank you so much, Tana, and thank you to Jennifer Frizzell and Crystal Paradis and the entire team at the fantastic New Hampshire Women's Foundation. I'm, I'm really grateful to you for bringing us together um, today. It's an important day, an important milestone in American history, uh, because today is the day that all the final paperwork was signed 100 years ago, and the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution became part of the law of the land. Um, I'm, I'm particularly excited and passionate uh, to talk tonight about voting rights and uh, particularly the voting rights of women, in part because, as Tana mentioned, I teach constitutional law in Concord at UNH Law School. Um, but I was also born on election day, so my interest in the subject is in part an accident of birth. Um, and I was very lucky to be born actually in Ward 1 in Nashua. So I'm, I'm an original constituent of Senator LeVake and uh, a proud one at that. Um, I was born on election day. My mom's water broke when she was in the voting booth. Um, but I think often, you know, about voting in New Hampshire and just where we are today. Uh, because I think, you know, we, we, we are meeting tonight on an important anniversary, uh, an important milestone. Uh, but we know very much that, as Tana said it so well, uh, that the work really continues, that uh, the, the struggle and the fight for, uh, for equal justice under law and for equal suffrage and, and, and participation in the franchise uh, continues to this day. And th this pandemic, you know, we're meeting in the midst of uh, the worst public health crisis in a century, the worst economic collapse since the Great Depression, um, a moment of, of really profound threats to the planet um, and, and a moment of profound reckoning uh, with the horrors of racial injustice and systemic racism in this country. Uh, but it's also a moment where voting rights are, are very much, um, they hang in the balance in a sense. Um, and in, in part, it's up to, to us, um, each of us, and I hope the one takeaway from tonight is that everyone will have a plan to vote both on November, on, on November 3rd, but also on September 8th. And we're gonna dive into a much more detailed discussion of that. Um, we're really lucky to have with us tonight uh, three fantastic panelists, 
each of whom has and will continue to be on the front lines of this fight uh, for it ha have been on the front lines for many years and will continue to be in for many years ahead. Um, so without further ado, I'd love to dive into, we're gonna hear from each of our three panelists um, this evening. Uh, we have, as Tana mentioned, Senator Melanie Levesque. Um, we have also with us Re Representative Margie Smith and we have also Lana Belkin. So I'm gonna, if it's all right, um, just dive right in with you, Senator Levesque. Um, with, if, you, if you wouldn't mind kicking us off. Um, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm very proud that my home district, Ward 1 in Nashua, elected you to represent us in the New Hampshire Senate uh, two, two years ago. And of course, you were first elected to the New Hampshire House back in 2006, but I, you, you are New Hampshire's first African-American senator. And you're serving right now, you're serving our state at a time when, as you've noted before, and as we're seeing, you know, just up until this very moment, um, a, a, a truly compelling call, um, perhaps the most compelling call for racial justice since the 1960s. And you recently called this our Selma moment. And I'm wondering if you could just say a little bit more about that. Um, I'm curious if you could say a little bit more about how you think we got to this important moment. Um, what motivates you personally to continue leading in this fight and what gives you hope about the road ahead? <laughs> Maggie, thank you very much for having me. Tana, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here with a wonderful panel and um, happy to share my thoughts and experiences with you. And the Selma moment was just a realization that I had because in the 60s, when um, people were fighting for civil rights, nobody was aware of what was happening until Selma, when hundreds of people were greeted with fire hoses and dogs and you know people, angry people, um, trying to hurt them. And this was all caught on TV. So that's when people realized what was going on. And when George Floyd was killed before our eyes, then we saw that it ripped off a Band-Aid that had been on for years, centuries, and people saw what was really happening. And then people wanted to know more and be a part of this change. So that's what I meant by the Sel Selma moment. And um, this change, voting is such an important part of this change because the people who vote are the people who determine the policy. And right now um, we are way off track. Um, we really need to move forward and make sure that everyone is able to vote. When you hear things about machines being taken away from the post office, I mean, this is not even democratic. However, the only way that we can change it is the way we do it in the United States, and that is by voting. So that's why we need everybody to use their voice. Remember that this is our moment of awakening, and the only way that we can make a change is by voting. Well, amen to that. Um, <laughs> you know, this, the US Supreme Court said that the right to vote is the right from which all other rights emanate. And I think that's really what you're saying, that you know, the way for us to to continue to be the country that we are is by engaging in the franchise and making it happen. Um, Absolutely. Representative Smith, um, you've dedicated so much of your life's work uh, to voting rights and, and to fighting for women. Uh, from serving as the first chair of the board of the New Hampshire Women's Policy Institute, uh, to serving as the national executive director for Women's Action for New Directions, which was an organization that was committed to reordering federal priorities and to increasing women's involvement in elective office, to doing what you're doing right now, which is running for your 12th term in the New Hampshire House. Um, I'm curious, as you see it, what's changed over the past 24 years since you were first elected, elected to the New Hampshire legislature? And what are your hopes for the 24 years ahead, or even for the, for the 100 years ahead? Thank you, Maggie. I do have to mention that while you were born on election day, I was born on George Washington's real birthday. 
So clearly, you know, my future was foreordained. Um, I don't know, Maggie, whether my mantra should be the more things change, the more they stay the same, or um, the times they are changing. I hear Melanie speak, and I hope it's the latter and not the former, but I can't be sure. Um, I went to D.C. Uh, when I was 21 with a master's degree in public administration, I was one of five women in my program and I was a novelty. Um, I worked in professional jobs um, and was taken seriously only by the people who worked with me and knew my abilities. Um, along that time, I married, and we would go to events, and my husband, who was working in the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department, would have an audience talking about what he did, and people would turn to me and say, oh, and you must be Mrs. Smith, because my role was in that social setting as a wife, a role I was happy to have, but not my only role. Um, and we moved, by the way, from Washington to Baltimore, moved 40 miles north into the Deep South in 1969, five years after the passage of the Civil Rights Act and then the Voting Rights Act. Um, and so when you talk about how much of things changed, I go back further than 24 years, and they have changed. There's no question that things have changed, but they haven't changed enough, and they haven't changed quickly enough. Uh, and uh, the inequities that face people of color, the inequities that pay, face people based on gender issues, and um, the inequities that, base, that face people based on economics have caused us to demonstrate that our system is very far from being a more perfect union. Can we make changes? Of course we can make changes. Um, we know that diversity equity and inclusion, DEI, are becoming um, a more of a, a, of a focal point, particularly, for example, as we look to the kind of administration that a President Biden might create, where the people who are in positions of power do not necessarily get there by the same traditional roots. Did they go to Harvard, Yale, Princeton? Um, are they economically um, of a class where they had established a social connection? What we have to do is look at a very new way of bringing disparate people into the decision-making process and mostly address access to voting so that we are seeing um, a different pattern than we've had for so many years. Well, one of the new voices here in New Hampshire, um, I'm very happy to say, is, is Polana Bilkin, who, uh, Polana, there's so much I want to ask you about. And um, one thing I, I hope you'll, you'll say something about is that you have uh, sought elective office here in New Hampshire. Um, and you've been serving uh, in, in your city. And you've also, at the same time, spent much of the past two years leading and winning uh, a number of efforts to ensure comprehensive gender identity protections in New Hampshire. So I'm, I'm hoping you might tell us a little bit more about your service and your work over the past two years. And in particular, if you could say a little bit about how New Hampshire compares to other states across the country when it comes to issues of identification and voting. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, so I think I'll kind of work backwards. I might start with some of the identification first. Um, 
Yeah, so I've been at the ECLU for about two years. I'm the trans justice organizer there. Um, and the job is as varied as the title makes it like it could sound to be. I do lobbying in the state house. I work with school boards who are looking to adopt trans student policies. Um, I originally got into activism really through the transgender non-discrimination bill here in New Hampshire several years back. Um, but then since there's been a lot of really great changes here in New Hampshire, including extending some of those protections. Um, there was a memo issued recently by the New Hampshire Department of Insurance that explicitly uh, prohibits healthcare discrimination on the basis of gender identity. Um, there was non-binary state ID. Um, it's been a pretty good couple years here in New Hampshire, but um, voting ends up being one of those areas where things still do get messy. Um, there was a study done about five years ago by uh, the Williams Institute over at UCLA Law, and they found that about one in four transgender people have no identification that actually matches how they live their life. Um, and only about half of those polled had a state ID. That was one of those documents in congruence. Um, some of that is because some of these documents, they cost money to change. Um, when I changed my passport over, it was definitely well over $150. I don't remember quite what it was, but it was quite a bit at the time. Um, and the attainability of that, a lot of these documents, they have totally different standards. Um, and they're all at different levels of being able to update them. So like, for example, um, on a passport, passport is something um, that uh, if, be, thanks to our Secretary of State in 2010, you should throw it in the chat if you know who that was, uh, made it so that we could uh, update uh, passports. And that was one of the first documents that folks were able to update a gender marker on with a, uh, with a doctor's note saying that they had, you know, had proper treatment and they were going to continue living for the foreseeable future in that role or whatever the language was uh, specifically. State ID caught up a couple years later, and now we also have a non-binary option, which is great. Although, um, you know, as of 100 years ago today, gender doesn't, it's not a qualifying factor for voting. You're allowed to vote. Um, and birth records, though, are something where it's nearly impossible to amend them here in New Hampshire. Um, it's, it's an undefined process, and it's left up to judges um, who kind of in... Um, inconsistently interpret the law to mean different things when it comes to being trans. Um, there's also that there's some people that live out of state, but they were born here. State law requires that they have um, a court order to prove evidence of their transition, but the state that they live in doesn't provide court orders for that part, that particular thing. Um, so that whole system has affected people who've moved on from New Hampshire, even that have just, you know, have to Born here. Um, there was legislation to try to make that uh, to make that change over the last two years. Last year it made it to the governor's desk and it was vetoed and then this year it kind of got lost in that whole COVID crunch that happened. Um, but I mean even when I went to go register to vote um, the last time I just moved to Rochester um, I was going to vote one week after I had moved here. So I was proving my citizenship with my birth record which had what would be pretty distinctly known as like a guy's name, I guess. Um, I was proving my identity with my state ID, which was updated uh, with my current name. And I was proving my domicile uh, with another document that listed a different last name. But I was able to show up. Um, I mean, it was, it was kind of bizarre, but showing up with, you know, here's the court orders that got me between the different names. Um, and they accepted that as proof of my I. I my identity, forwarded it to the Secretary of State. And if there had been questions, they could have been clarified after. But, um, and even if you don't have those documents, there's the challenge voter affidavit um, so that you can get your voter, so that you can get your vote counted on that day and then deal with some of the paperwork after the fact. So that's, you, you mentioned that um, there have been some important wins, but also um, some setbacks and some, you know, important legislation that's been vetoed. Um, and I want to, I want to, I want to come back to you, Fauna, because I, I'm, gonna, I, I would like for you to, at, um, at some point, t to tell us more about what motivated you to run for office, and, and just to make the plug for, um, 
for, for new and, and more inclusive voices in New Hampshire government. But I want to turn back to, to you first, um, Senator Levake. You are the chair of the Senate Election Law and Municipal Affairs Committee. And you've led the way, and I've been really proud to, to watch as you've led the way on a number of really important legislative reforms that have all, the unifying theme seems to me that they've all been designed to ensure that all qualified voters and only qualified voters in New Hampshire have uh, more accessible voting options and that as a state, we have a more modernized system of election administration uh, this year in particular, but also in the years ahead. Mm -hmm. And you're, the case that you've made has been a really strong one, but in some ways a really simple one. You've said, and you said most recently in an op-ed published uh, this summer, that voting should be safe, fair, and easy. Um, so that's, I, I think you said it really well, and I couldn't say it any better. Um, I'm curious, as you see it, what challenges, particular challenges, uh, do voters face this fall, especially women and communities of color in New Hampshire? Um, given that we're in the middle of a pandemic, um, what challenges do you see and what legislative changes have been made uh, that, that you'd say have been important um, to making voting uh, safe, fair, and easy this fall? Well, thank you for the great question. Um, this year, you know, we were very keenly aware of COVID and the possibilities of being a flare up in the fall, especially for our um, November elections. And so our biggest concern was how do we keep, you know, people from flooding the polls? Like we see pictures of Wisconsin. We don't want people in long lines or even short lines, but being close to each other. I mean, I've been in Manchester seeing people in line, five, five lines, five people deep. We want to prevent that. So this idea of the absentee ballot being for, uh, first of all, a no excuse absentee ballot would have been preferable. Um, but our fallback was based on COVID, anybody would be able to vote absentee. So um, that was actually passed and it's a very good thing. Um, there is a little bit of confusion around how to register and then also how to get your ballot. But there are plenty of websites um, online, uh, the Secretary of State's office, but also ACLU has a great website. Is it vote? Uh, Vote2020.org, yeah. yeah. They have a great website, um, as well as the um, Democratic Party vote in nh.org. And so there are sites that will help you walk through the process um, it's important to get the ballots in early. And if it's too close to the election, they will be accepted up to five o'clock election day. But if it's too close to the election, you really want to bring it in to the clerk rather than rely on the mail. But if, you're, if you do choose to go to the polls, then there's going to be PPE and social distancing and um, each poll location will have their set up to keep people safe. Um, we ask that you wear your mask, and if you don't have a mask, there will be masks for you. So again, we want people to be safe. Another issue is that um, when you request your absentee ballot, typically you would request the primary or the general, one at a time. This new request form allows you to ask for both at one time. So that improves the process. But also, speaking of processing, uh, many of our larger towns already had a problem with many, many absentee ballots. So it would take them hours to count. And we're talking about um, poll workers who have been working all day and now they have to stay late into the evening to count the absentee ballots. So knowing that um, we were gonna have twice as many, uh, if not more, perhaps 50% of our people will be voting absentee we wanted to put in place a process where you could start processing the ballots early, but it would have to be on one day and a specific day that was publicized and communicated to everyone so that people could see this publicly. So that's an important process as well. But the interesting thing about these three changes is that these are things that we should be doing anyway. We should have the ability to 
have an absentee ballot and not have to pick one of the 15 excuses that are listed. We are 18 and older. We are adults. This is our constitutional right. And it, I'm, it makes me think of the woman who said, you know, I had to choose between should I feed my kids or should I go to the polls? I mean, she's working all day. Then she has to go home and take care of her family. This is the life that we lead, a very busy life. And I feel the same about um, registering to vote. Um, I sponsored the SMART Act, automated voter registration, studied it with three different states, worked on it for about two years, and finally got it to the point where it passed the, the Senate, it passed the House, and it went to the governor and it was vetoed. But something like that would have helped us right now in the time of COVID to register voters and not have to have them be at their town clerk's office. And I have to share with you something that really saddened me when I was speaking on the floor of the Senate, when one of the senators said, if you can't make it to the town clerk's office, then we don't want your vote. I don't feel that way. I don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat, I'm gonna fight for your right to vote and also the undeclared. But you know, it's about all of us having this constitutional right that is so important. So the modernizations that we talk about, even online voter registration, my daughter asked me when she was in line in Manchester, five deep, she said, can I just do this online? And I said, you know, this is New Hampshire. No, you can't yet, but we're working on it. But something as simple as changing your address could be done online rather than taking more time at the polls. So um, also ERIC, the Electronic Registration Information Center, would allow us to check um, other states' voting records and uh, voting lists very quickly. It took nine months for the Secretary of State's office to review all of the records from 2016 to find five fraudulent voters. With ERIC, we would find it like this. And it also sends out registration cards, so if you're eligible, but not registered, it will give you a little reminder and this is where you, how, how you register. So things like that will promote voting and not for one party, but for all people. So speaking of um, voting for all people and fairness, regardless of party, I wanna ask you, Representative Smith, as a member of the New Hampshire House, uh, you've led the way on a wide range of legislative measures designed to ensure free and fair elections in New Hampshire. But one of um, the first measures that I had a chance to see you in action on was um, the independent redistricting effort, uh, which was a bipartisan effort um, that you really helped to spearhead in the House. And I, I wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit more about why an independent redistricting commission, in your view, is so essential to the health and future of New Hampshire's democracy um, but also wanted to invite you to to um, to respond to to some of the really important things that represent that Senator Levesque has just said about modernization and New Hampshire election administration. I mean, I throw out there just as a question. I I often wonder whether New Hampshire would have actually been able to successfully carry out our primary this year um, if the pandemic had um, really exploded in the United States just a few weeks before. In some ways, we were saved. Um, we were really lucky that it didn't happen. The timing worked out that we were able to vote. But I just wonder if if you could if you could talk about the independent redistricting effort, but also the broader issue of modernizing New Hampshire election law. Well, let me deal with the second part first. Um, we have a long way to go in terms of modernizing our election procedures. But I do want to make one point, and that is, um, although our, our um, current Secretary of State has been very hesitant to consider any changes, one of the uh, safety checks that we have in this state comes from the fact that we have a printed ballot. So even if you are using an electronic device, we still have a printed ballot. And that means when there's a question and there's a need for a recount, 
we can do that in New Hampshire in a way that's much safer and much more reliable than that what happens in any other state. So we do have to be careful not to um, toss the baby out with the bathwater and that some of our old fashioned ways um, are good. A lot aren't. Um, and there's so many ways we could we can improve. But let me go back to um, the, the question of independent redistricting, um, because that happens before anyone gets to even cast a vote. And we use the word gerrymander, and not everybody knows what gerrymander means, um, but it is drawing district lines um, in such a way as to favor one group over another. Once every 10 years in this country, since the beginning, we have conducted um, a census. And then after the census results are in, each state is allocated the number of seats they will have in the US Congress, and each state has to draw district lines. It wasn't until uh, 175 years later that that principle was applied through a series of court decisions were applied to um, uh, the principle of having fair and equitable districts drawn to Congress and also the state Senate, the state house, whatever, um, and based on population. Um, this should be a fair process, but it's not in New Hampshire. The redistricting process has been conducted here behind closed doors, out of the public eye, and backroom decisions are made so that politicians can decide who would get to vote for them rather than the voters deciding who they get to vote for. We have a second congressional, I mean, a second executive council district that goes from the Connecticut River to the ocean. And it looks like a salamander, gerrymander salamander. And it was drawn for one purpose only. It was drawn to get as many Democrats into that district and out of other districts so that the people who were drawing the lines, who were Republicans, could say, okay, that seat's going to go Democratic, but it will make it easier for us to maintain Republicans in the other districts. And that happens not just in the Executive Council, it also happens in Senate districts and in House districts. Uh, and that's wrong. I must say that it has been Republicans who have been drawing those district lines. But I have no reason to believe that if Democrats were drawing those district lines, they wouldn't be tempted to do the same thing. So that if the Democrats were in charge in 2021, in the House, the Senate, and the government, the same thing might happen. Um, yeah, it's just of the Independent Redistricting Commission, right? Which is the whole- So the purpose of the Independent Redistricting Commission is to change all that. It's to get it out in the public, to have, we have so many opportunities now that we didn't have even 10 years ago in terms of technical uh, support to be able to figure out the fairest way and the best way to draw those district lines without regard uh, to political party. Um, we've had, we've spent enormous amounts of money in this state because in the last two, in the 2000 and the 2010 redistricting, went to the courts, the courts, lots and lots of, of costs um, that we've all had to pay. There was one round where the Supreme Court actually drew the district lines and um, some of the lines are laughable. With all due respect to the courts, they actually brought somebody in from North Carolina who wasn't quite familiar with the realities of, um, 
district lines. Representative Ned Gordon has a district in the House where you can't get there from here. He can't he can't drive from one part of his district to another. Um, there's a there was a Senate district where the only place two towns touched were a picture of pie, and the pie is cut into slices. One town was slice one, one town was slice three. The only place those two towns touched was at the point. That point happened to be in the middle of a bay. Um, that's no way to draw district lines. And an independent redistricting commission could do this in a fair and equitable way, maintaining the rights of every voter, regardless of party, regardless of gender, um, regardless of race, regardless of religion. And um, we've tried it twice with a bipartisan, a strong bipartisan support. The governor has vetoed it each time. He doesn't understand the difference between political action and partisan action. Um, and he made a partisan decision. And I am pleased to tell you that I have full intentions of submitting the bill again as soon as we can file. And this time, maybe we'll get the governor to sign it. I have a feeling that at, 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 a, very, at a very minimum, Senator Levesque will be leading the effort in the Senate. So yeah. we know- Absolutely, sure. as she always has with brilliance. So the, we're very lucky to have you both here for that. Um, Lana, I wanna, I wanna ask you, um, if, if I could just tell us a bit about what led you to run um, for office. You're serving, you know, on a on a local level and in a in a nonpartisan on a nonpartisan basis. But if particularly, you know, imagine a year ago when you were first elected, you you may not have anticipated that uh, local government would really be at the center of some of the biggest decisions that are being made in this country right now. So if you could just speak a little bit about your own experience. I'd be really grateful. Totally. Um, yeah, so absolutely not at all did anyone running for local office last year picture that that would be going on. But, um, you know, I think overall this whole situation going on with, um, I mean, on so many levels. For example, there are school districts in New Hampshire right now that are, you know, like dealing with, do they want another school resource officer? They are dealing with, should we get rid of our racist mascot? They're dealing with, um, do we need police oversight? Um, some places already have that, um, but it's, it's obviously maybe not doing it, doing its, uh, doing it, its role. And there's some elements like, you know, like, I mean, while there's things like city councilor and state rep, there are also spots on, you know, like towns and cities have commissions on some of these things already. Um, and uh, here, I'm, gonna, I'm about to post a link. So something that the ACLU has kind of been focusing on this year is really, you know, like the importance of local office and that, you know, top level change is really good, but um, even when good laws are passed, you still need people to really uh, fight out and run that last mile or the last marathon. Maybe there's a whole other marathon that's added onto your race, uh, but you need great people at a local level who are able to work on that. Um, and you know, like a lot of these offices benefit from an anonymous nature um, or they're, you know, people are running uncontested for years. Um, they, you know, nobody is stepping up to, to do these things that are important. And I've just seen so many of my friends get activated through different ways. You know, for me, it was being at the state house and saying like, hey, I have a backyard um, that you know, my backyard meaning my city, you know, like there's, there are important things going on here um, and I would like to be involved in that. Um, and I know that that's true across so many awesome city councilors and state reps and state senators, uh, candidates of all kinds, really. Um. Well, thank you for that. I, um, I wanna... Here, we want to hear more from you. The, a question that's come in, and I should say, I should have said at the beginning, uh, we're hoping to hear questions from, from everyone out there, from our audience. Um, so please, uh, we hope you'll submit some questions. We've got 15 minutes left, um, but 
for the in the Q and A box um, on the Zoom chat function. We had a few come in in advance, and one that I I I want to throw out to all three of our panelists. Um, it's a question from dear friend of mine, actually, Olivia Zink. This was not coordinated in advance. This came in uh, very organically from Olivia. She's, she's um, with Open Democracy Action, and she lives in Franklin, New Hampshire. And here's what, here's what Olivia asks of the panel. She says, rightly so, points out, women won the right to vote in the Spanish influenza pandemic. COVID-19 has exposed many weaknesses in our democracy. How can women best advocate for improvements in our democracy, such as fair districts with an independent redistricting commission, online voter registration, and getting big money out of politics so that we can have honest and fair elections for the next 100 years? So I love this question because it's really, uh, it sort of picks up where you just left off, Juana, which is what can we do here in New Hampshire, um, all of us who are engaged in, in this fight, uh, what can we do now and particularly in the next um, 68 days. So the, Senator Levy, could we start with you? Oh, sure. Do you want me to give you all of mine or just <laughs> pick a couple? Take it um, away. Okay. Well, you know, first of all, I think education is important. Uh, understanding what the issues are, and it doesn't have to be a deep dive, but just listening to other people, like evenings like this, learning about the issue, and then advocating for the issue. So you advocate with your friends, you can advocate by writing letters, um, but stand up for that issue. And then voting. I mean, you, we need everybody to come vote because we can't change the policies unless we vote. And then finally, running for office, just as Polana did. Running for office is so important for us to have a seat at the table. Um, we passed a bill on uh, allowing campaign funds to pay for daycare for candidates. Now that wouldn't have happened if we didn't have a young person who was a state representative who could bring her perspective to the table. So, and Polana's, um, the issues that she's bringing up, they wouldn't have happened if there weren't people advocating and being at the table to present these things. So, um, there you have it. I'm sure that there are more. Um, Representative Smith, can I, can, do you want to add to that? Well, well, yes. One of the uh, serious problems we face as a society today is that um, the fourth estate, the fourth branch of our government, um, uh, that helps to make our government work basically is... Um, uh, is dying, and that is the independent press, the independent, I say press because I'm old-fashioned, the independent media. Voters today do not have the opportunity that we had for so many years of having strong independent uh, sources uh, telling us who all the candidates were and what the candidates believed in. Now it is very difficult, and particularly uh, at the moment because of our isolation, I refer to myself as being on house arrest, mm -hmm. um, to get the word out about who we are and, and what we believe in. Um, and uh, until and unless the public elects people who care about these issues, it's not going to change. You know, we have 400 people in the House, and frequently it's hard to find enough candidates. And somebody says, gee, you know, my neighbor's a nice guy. I don't agree with him on anything, but I see he's running, so I'll vote for him. And then there's a surprise when your lovely neighbor, who's a great neighbor, advocates for positions that you find um, anathema. And it happens because we do not have enough of an educated uh, voter uh, presence. Um, when you look at the votes that the governor vetoed and realize a, f a few people, a few people in more in the House or in the Senate could have made a difference you realize how important it is to decide. Um, relative to domicile, residency, voter registration, 
and in investigation of voter uh, of, of voter verification relative to the terms of resident inhabitant um, the interstate voter registration cross check pro, uh, process the independent redistricting commission we won't have to mention that again um, the list goes on and on just in the area of voting rights um, establishing the secure modern registration act each of these is an example of two three five or ten more people in the house or in the senate could make the difference and it's not that the voters don't care it's that they don't know and they don't have easy access to this kind of information well so i think you what you both said is there's so much that is on the ballot this fall. And I want to turn to you, Polana, um, if I could, because there have been a couple of questions that have been thrown out. And Senator Levesque, I would love for you to, to, to um, weigh in on this as well. But if it's possible, um, we have the one and only Crystal Paradis who's going to pull up a screen of uh, just so we can have a visual of um, vote, vote NH2020.org, uh, which is one of the two websites that we've mentioned so far. Uh, during during this event, uh, Senator Levesque also mentioned another fantastic website, which is voteinnh.org. Vote um, this this website, though, we're very um, indebted to the ACLU of New Hampshire for creating this web website, um, which I can tell you, I, I mentioned my mom at the beginning of this panel, she has voted in person in New Hampshire for uh, her entire lifetime of voting, but she was able to uh, request an absentee ballot and vote absentee using this website. So I believe anyone can do it. Um, my mom has many talents, but one of them is not uh, being tech savvy. So I believe anyone can do this. And uh, I want to turn to you, Polana, if you could. We've had a couple of questions that have come in on the nuts and bolts of voting. And we have a, about eight minutes left. And I just thought um, for the next two or three minutes, uh, we might be able to knock out some of those questions. Uh, one of the questions that was asked uh, by Karen from, from Rye uh, was how do we know if our absentee ballot has been received? And I think on this website, what you'll find is there are, is a very clear explanation of each of the steps involved in both uh, the registration process, the absentee voting process, and one of, one of the steps in the absentee voting process is tracking your ballot. And that is, you know, we talked about the need for modernizing New Hampshire election law uh, one of the one of the things we do have um, right now available is a is a ballot tracking system for absentee ballots. So it is possible to do that, and through vote nh twenty vote nh twenty twenty uh, you can navigate that whole system. But Polana, is is there more you want to say about this fantastic gift to the people of New Hampshire? In yeah, website? sure, brief, brief. Yeah, um, you know this site covers all of. I mean, you'll see uh, Crystal is scrolling past step eight, nine, 10 on how to vote absentee. So it is a very complicated and exact process. So I recommend, you know, using this site to guide through. Um, you'll see right there, it, uh, it links over to the Secretary of State's website so that you can check if you are registered to vote. This guides you through registering to vote, voting absentee. Uh, we also just added um, Spanish language to voting a absentee, which I think is the only uh, voting we website in New Hampshire right now uh, with that with that feature. There you go. See, it's right in the drop down. That's uh, true. Sure. Sure. question on that from Courtney, um, Courtney Perrin from Bradford. So glad that we we were able to answer that one. That there is in fact Spanish language, and is it just Spanish language, or do we have other languages? It's Spanish right now. I'm not sure if there's anything else on its way. Um, one other thing that I'll point out is exactly what Crystal is scrolling over right now. We have a frequently asked questions section, uh, unlike any other. We cover, can you vote if you are homeless? Can you vote if I was formerly incarcerated? Can I vote if I am on parole or probation? Uh, all the answer to all of those are yes. It also goes through some of the ID stuff that I talked about that comes into play uh, with transgender folks. Uh, including, you know, what if I change my name legally, but my ID doesn't up or it isn't updated yet? What if my photo ID has a different name than my voter registration 
kind of guiding people through a lot of those questions that maybe you only come into contact with once, but it's at a really critical moment. Uh, and it's better to know so that you can go into it ready. But um, yeah, no, I, I'm really proud of this site. And it was cool because I had been distributing some of this voting wall trans stuff separately of other voting info. And it was really great to see it all incorporated and pulled into one resource that's easy to go to um, and is available in multiple languages now. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Well, we've got about four minutes left and I know we've got to end right on time uh, this evening. So Senator Lubeck, I want to turn it back to you and give you the chance um, to, you know, I think one of, one of the things that's at the forefront of everyone's minds, um, and Emmett Soldati has asked a great a great question about what changes have been made uh, to accommodate voting. He asked about uh, the local and state state levels uh, that, that you believe should carry on for future elections. But uh, I just want to turn it over to you to, to answer that question or to add anything else um, that we weren't able to cover in this far too short amount of time. Well, the changes that um, we have made with the no excuse absentee ballot basically is something that should carry on. Um, the change that I would like to see is that we automate some of our processes like how to register to vote. I, I think that would help New Hampshire a great deal. There are over 300,000 people who are not registered. So this would make it easier. I do want to say when I say uh, moder modernize, I don't mean get rid of the paper ballot. The paper ballot is one of the best practices that all states are striving to get to now. So we always want to have that backup and, and it's a great thing that our Secretary of State did. But I also want to talk about the independent redistricting that that is another really critical piece that we need to implement. I think when we can implement this, we will have a better working government and we will also be taking some of the money out of politics because it takes a lot more money to, to uh, run an election when you have so many people that are, are different and you're vying with each other um, for those dollars. But I really do look forward to that day when we can have redistricting, when we can spend less money on running for office and that it can be open to more people. So thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Levesque. Representative Smith? Well, I think we have a, a long list of things that the House and the Senate have identified. Um, uh, obviously, they're, they're new ideas. I believe very strongly in campaign finance reform. I believe in public financing of elections, not private. And that isn't necessarily in the forefront of some of what we've done, but the opportunities to take our, uh, our system and improve it are, are significant. Much of what we do is good, and I think it's important to understand that, that we, we, we have much that's much better than we have in other states, but we still have a long way to go, and I repeat, the line I used before, we have to work towards a more perfect union. And uh, Polana, I know I, we've got Tana here and I know we've got to wrap up in a moment, but I, I just want to give you the chance to, to add anything um, that we weren't able to cover. Um, no, I, I, I think independent redistricting is super important. Um, you know, there was, like I mentioned, there was that birth record bill that's fallen through the cracks twice now, and that would be something that would make voting easier, it would make enrolling for school easier, it makes starting driving easier, it makes getting government benefits easier um, for people. They don't have to out themselves. And that's something that, you know, it plays out in so many ways, and primarily when you only vote, and it kind of acts as a method of intimidation for some. So I would, I would say that is something that outside of an explicit voting rights uh, action that that's something that would uh, you know make it a lot easier for trans folks to vote. Well I want to turn it back over to Tana Clues and thank all of all three of our panelists. This has been such a treat for me and um, really grateful for the chance to talk with you all and hope to continue the conversation in the days ahead. So thank you. Thank you all and thank you Tana.
Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Melanie, I know that you have to get off, but I just wanted to give you a special thanks for joining us. I know each of you are so busy in the legislature and it's really wonderful that you can join us tonight. So thanks to Melanie, uh, Marjorie, Polana, and Maggie. You are all incredible assets to New Hampshire and we are so grateful for the work that you have done and continue to do on behalf, behalf of every New Hampshire uh, voter. As you've heard tonight, there are so many obstacles to voting that still exist and the COVID-19 pandemic has really increased those obstacles. But as you've heard tonight, there are many tools and many people like these women here tonight ready to help you. As I said at the beginning of the program, as we celebrate the 100th anniversary of women securing the right to vote, let's fulfill the promise of the 19th Amendment by ensuring that all people can vote. Here are just a few of the things that you can do to help fulfill the promise of the 19th Amendment. First, of course, register to vote and help other women register to vote. Make sure you have a voting plan and everyone you know also has a voting plan. Run for office. As you probably know, we have a nonpartisan program here in New Hampshire called Women Run, which is the only nonpartisan program training and empowering women to run for office. Motivate other women to run if you don't want to, especially women of color who we believe need to be able to step up and shine here in New Hampshire. Advocate for policies and laws that expand opportunities for voting, such as expanded absentee and mail-in voting, improved access for women with disabilities, eliminating dis discriminatory voter ID laws, etc. And finally, over the next couple months, join us for a few of our She Votes events. In fact, one of them is starting right after this. And if you go to our website, www.nhwomensfoundation.org 19th, you'll be able to register for an event that PBS is doing with a special showing of the vote. And later this fall on October 22nd, please join us for our virtual Women Building Community Luncheon, which we're dubbing Women Lunch Online, to hear more about our 19th Amendment programming and all that we intend to do this fall. So thank you again for joining us. I really appreciate each of you taking the time tonight and to all of our attendees, thanks for your wonderful questions. Have a wonderful night.